Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to uh, St. Andrew Christian Church, all of you. Um, I'm just looking for the right notes here, excuse me. <laughs> there we go. Um, yes, we are happy to have you here worshiping with us, you here and those watching. I would like to, well, our pastor, Morgan um, Wickheiser, is on vacation for two weeks, as is our pianist and organist. So um, we have guests today who are helping us with worship. We are fortunate to have Natalie Hu, she's hiding back there in the corner, <laughs> on piano, and the Reverend Audrey Connor preaching. I think most of you know her. So. <laughs> Um, I invite those who are comfortable doing so to stand for the call to worship. Following Jesus is difficult, so many things have laid claim to our lives. We don't know if we can let go and truly follow. Lord, search our hearts and speak to our spirits. Encourage us to freely follow you. Help us to be faithful disciples, joyfully proclaiming your transforming power and love. We come to follow the ways of Christ to worship God. Yeah. Let us pray. Revealing God, we would see Jesus. Open our eyes now to Christ's living presence as we attend to your word in holy scriptures and listen for the voice of Christ speaking to us. Through prayer and praise, through bread and wine, let us know that Christ is in our midst and communes with us. We pray now the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Um, the first scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, and then um, 13 through 25. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. To live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drank and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Thank you so much for the music, Lily. It's nice to be with you all this morning. It's been a while since I've been with you in person. Uh, I think the last time I was here, I was here online. So how wonderful to both be online and to see faces. Um, but now is our time for our children's moment. Um, and I don't know if, if you wanna come forward and be closer, we have, or not, but this is for our children. And um, I just wanted to tell them or talk with you. All right, cool. The story that we're going to be hearing today um, is about Jesus hanging out with his buddies, um, his best friends. I would consider them his best friends, James and John. 
Did you know, does anybody know what James and John's nickname is? Has anybody heard, know their early church nickname? They were called the Sons of Thunder. Um, we're gonna hear why in a minute. But um, they represent, I think for a lot of our imagination, the anger um, that we often have. I don't know if any of you have gotten angry before, but I have a feeling all of us deal with anger. I wonder what happens, what you do, when someone calls you a name. Do you ever call them a name back? Do you ever call them a name back if someone's mean to you? Sometimes, uh, what's that? A bully. a bully, yeah. Yeah, that would be a bullying thing to do, wouldn't it? What do you think would happen if you did call them a name back? My guess is they might call you another name. I could see it going back and forth that you could just start, you call them a name, they call you a name, and pretty soon you know what happens? You're not friends. Yeah. The story this morning is about people that were mean to Jesus' really good friends, James and John, and they wanted to be mean right back. And Jesus told them, don't do that. I don't know. I wonder how hard it was for them not to be mean right back. But Jesus tells them, if you're going to hang out with me, you can't be mean right back. My wish for all of us is when there are people in our lives that might be bullies, that might be mean to us, that we can try to find a way not to be mean back, but instead to show kindness. And if, they, if that doesn't work and they keep being mean, to just walk away. That's what Jesus seemed to be instructing the sons of thunder to do. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the ways that you show kindness to us, and we just ask you to please help us to always show kindness, even in the face of bullying, even in the face of people who are mean. Teach us to be people of love. In your name we pray. Amen. There are uh, printed copies of the announcements on the table in the back of the sanctuary for those of you who do not uh, get them on a Friday email. Yes, it says up here to welcome our guest minister. Yes, we did that, but they didn't know that (laughs) I was going to be ahead of Uh, If you would like to serve as worship leader or offer prayers at communion, please contact Jojo Johnson, either by email. Um, I think it gives the email up there. And there are sign-up sheets in the Narthex. Vacation Bible School, we had an amazing week. Uh, The garden update, uh, the garden gang had their first harvest this week, delivering four pounds of radishes. Gee, and 4.2 pounds of turnip tops to the Help My Neighbor Food Bank. Uh, Adult Conference of the Christian Church in Ohio this coming week, June 27th to July 1st at Northwest Christian Church. Um, More information on that is on our bulletin board. Our next monthly potluck will be held between the two worship services on Sunday, July 10th. If you are looking for inspiration, Linda Lane, fellowship chairman, suggests a patriotic themed dish, something red, white, and blue, or a traditional American dish. Or if you cook like me, buy something in the grocery store that (laughs) has those colors in it. Uh, Weekly events, just briefly, adult Sunday school at 9, yoga classes are meeting on Tuesdays at 2.30, knitting for others right after that at 3.30, gardening group at 9 o'clock Wednesdays, hopefully to get there before it gets too hot. Um, You're free to come and help or even bring a brown bag lunch and join them at lunch at 10 o'clock. 
women's Bible study. Um, if uh, well, call Charlotte Allred if you would like to become involved with that. So if there are no more, I think it's time for a hymn. Lift every voice and sing. I don't know what number that is in your <laughs> in your hymn. Don't you just follow the words. <laughs> Our second scripture is from Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of them. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. 
As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we just ask you to speak to us and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Where is your face set? In our scripture, you heard the New Revised Standard Version that says, when the days drew near that Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. But I looked at other versions. The New International Version says, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Or the Good News Bible, another version I like, said, he made up his mind and set out on his way. I personally like, he set his face to Jerusalem. Where is your face set? I learned a long time ago that our faces literally change our outlook. Have you heard about this research? That if you make yourself smile, whether you're happy or not, just doing that thing to your face, it makes you happy. They've done research. Triggering certain facial muscles can trick your brain into thinking that you're happy. My brother-in-law, ran cross country when he was in high school, and he taught me that when you're going up hills, when you're running, it's best to put your face down. He said, if you look on the horizon at the hill, he's, he's from West Virginia, he said it can feel like the hill is gonna last forever, but if you just put power through it, you'll be over it before you know it. Where is your face set? Our scripture writer this morning was not sharing tricks of the brain, what we are getting this morning is a vision of incarnation, of God embodied in the flesh with a face that resembles yours and mine. A face that's aware of the pain ahead in Jerusalem and still goes toward it. What is God calling your face toward? Where is your face set? Nashville. <laughs> We'll have to wonder what's in Nashville. <laughs> Through the pandemic, we saw lots of ads on TV. I know I saw a lot of t-shirts in the hospital that read, not all superheroes wear capes. Have you seen this? Usually there's a picture of people with stethoscopes and scrubs, reminding us that God was calling many of our medical professionals to set their face toward people with COVID-19. They were and are our real life superheroes. But sometimes we're not trained for where God is calling us. Sometimes we're called toward hard conversations. The one where you're finally gonna share how you've been feeling, or where you share how things are really going at work, or at church, or even in your marriage or friendships. Where is God calling you toward? Maybe for you it's more nebulous than even that. Climate scientist and evangelical Dr. Catherine Hayhoe writes that the reality is that more than 70% of people in the U.S. are already worried about climate change, and about 35% of those people are really worried. So she says the biggest problem is not getting people to be on board. The biggest problem is we don't know what to do, and when we don't know what to do, we do nothing. Maybe God is calling you to set your face toward something, but you don't know what. Reverend David Hett, who's a local minister and friend of mine, recently reflected on this dilemma, and he offered a spiritual practice called empty protest. He examined the spiritual guru, James Hillman's spiritual concept of kenosis, 
or self-emptying, modeled on Jesus who emptied himself in the form of a servant. Hillman expands it to political action. He says, politically, I am pretty empty. He says, describing how difficult it is to know best how to make change in society. In empty protest, Hillman says, you take your outrage seriously, but you don't force yourself to have the answers. What is God calling you to set your face toward? Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem, and we learn that even God incarnate cannot avoid conflict on this earth. In fact, the very next thing that happens is conflict. A Samaritan village rejects him. And when they do, we know James and John, you now know nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, in part because of this scripture, wish to command fire upon it. It does not take long for Jesus to be in dangerous waters. There's no getting around it. Jesus sets his face toward a place of conflict, and violence nearly rises up. It's easy to think of James and John as temperamental. In fact, you know they were called the Sons of Thunder in part because of this, but before condemning them and their instinct of violence, we would be wise to see it from their perspective. In this same chapter, they just witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. Do you remember that? It was James and John and Peter, and they go up to the mountain and they see Jesus hanging out with Moses and Elijah. And then we know that God said to them, listen to him. Perhaps James and John are echoing Elijah's summoning of heavenly fire to consume soldiers when a similar thing happened to Elijah. When we know we're right, it can seem like violence is okay, can it? We certainly know when it is senseless. We are reeling from another mass shooting at an elementary school for which there are no words. But we don't have to leave Columbus to witness senseless acts of violence. Do you know that since April 23rd, there have been five shootings at five parks here in Columbus, resulting in four deaths and four wounded? We do know senseless violence. But for James and John, was it senseless? We're inundated with arguments to carry weapons or not carry weapons, to think about when it's okay to be violent and when it's not. James and John invite us to examine those places in our lives when we respond to conflict with more conflict, or even up the ante with our conflict, with physical violence or more physical violence. Jesus set his face to Jerusalem and on the way, he teaches James and John, he teaches us another way to respond to conflict with a stance of love and of peace without brokenness and loss. Jesus sets his face toward conflict, but without violence. And he rebukes the sons of thunder. The incarnation of God is traveling with his face set to Jerusalem, with his band of disciples in tow, and we learn that this is a face of purpose, this is a face of peace and of love, and a face who has to rebuke even his closest disciples. This chapter began with Jesus giving authority to these disciples over demons and disease. Do you remember that? It's right at the beginning of chapter 9. He charges them to go off and to cure people, and he sent them out and said to them, if a town rejects you, do you remember what you're supposed to do? Go home. Go home. That's right. Go home. Shake the dust off of your feet. Do you remember that scripture? You shake the dust off as a testimony to that town, he says. He doesn't say cast evil upon them. He then takes who I imagine these best students to be. We know about Peter, James, and John. They're with him all the time. And they're the ones that get to witness him with Moses and Elijah. They're the ones that then see him transfigured. And God speaks to them. Listen to my son. And then in this very same chapter, we meet these same disciples who've spent substantial time with Jesus, witnessing miracle and wonder. These disciples who seem to be getting it more than anyone else, have to be rebuked. To be God incarnate 
is to face misunderstanding, even by your closest friends, your closest disciples. After this confrontation with his own friends, we see strangers, what appear to be strangers, coming up to him and asking him to join the movement. They see something happening, and he says to them, you want to follow me? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Is that what you want to follow? You want to follow me? You have to let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, you proclaim the kingdom of God. You want to follow me? No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is not trying to be misunderstood. He attempts to let us know this is not a movement for the weak-hearted. To be a people of peace is hard work. It involves following Jesus to those places of conflict in our lives with vulnerability rather than with might. And it can be lonely. I've been thinking a lot in preparation for this morning about what it means to follow Jesus. I wonder about those first disciples who were able to see God in the flesh and still wanted to rely on their own might instead of Jesus. There are so many places in this world that conflict is dividing us. This week alone, we've been reminded of the political divide around rights of women. Throughout the last two years, we had lots of division in our country around vaccination. In the last few weeks, I know as a hospital chaplain, I always go in rooms and visit people and on the TV are hearings about another event that is dividing us on January 6th. But this division in our lives extends far and it extends near. It divides families over opinions. And we have our own histories that divide us as well, all of us. Sometimes forgiveness can feel like a bridge too far. It's very tempting when we're confronted by conflict to put our heads in the sand and just concentrate on trivial things. Is there a conflict that you've been avoiding that you need to enter into? Is there a place of conflict that you're wondering how to go in without weapons and still have the courage to be there? Jesus doesn't call us to put our heads in the sand. He makes himself and his followers vulnerable and present as people of love. I wonder where you are in the story. Are you with Jesus, following him to, into that conflict too? Are you bravely going without weapons in hand? Is that you dipping your toe in the water just to see what it would take to change your life and maybe not quite ready to commit? There's a great t-shirt I used to wear. It's got too many holes in it now. But it says on it, not all who wander are lost. Jesus' face is set with purpose. But I wonder what it's like to be those disciples. I wonder if at times for them, it feels like wandering. To try to follow him no matter where he goes, I wonder if wandering is how you might feel at times. There's a man on a pedestrian bridge. I see him when I'm driving home from work. I go up 315 North and he stands just on that bridge right before you hit Henderson. Maybe you've seen him or maybe you know him. He stands in the middle of the bridge with a sheet that he made. It looks like a self-made sheet, and it says on it um, three things. I tried to write it down the last time because I knew I was going to talk about it, and I couldn't get it all, and I couldn't find it online. I think he's just a one-man act. And it says on it, climate action, Medicare for all, and something else. I wonder about this man. I wonder if he's trying to follow God's will, trying to make a difference by bringing wholeness and peace to a climate that needs our attention and so many people that need affordable health care. I wonder if God said to him, you have to do something, and he's trying to respond. It's hard to know how to move forward at times, but we need to. We follow a savior with his face set toward those broken places of conflict in our world as a presence of love and peace, and we are called to join him. It can be a lonely call at times when other people just don't get it. It can feel like we're that man on the bridge trying to follow, trying to affect 
the change that God wants, trying to share God's love and God's peace and God's healing without knowing if we're making a difference. And folks, I don't know the answers. I wonder and I wander like you. But what I know is that God needs us now more than ever. I know that God so loved this world that he gave us a savior to teach us how to love it too. To teach us that as we follow him, God will find a way to surprise us into new life. It will probably not be a way free of conflict, this path that we follow, but God will be with us in the conflict, giving us love and joy and peace and kindness and patience and generosity and faithfulness and self-control if we ask for it. May we learn together to live by the Spirit, to be guided by the Spirit, as Paul says in the Galatians, and may we set our face to the Jerusalems that are calling us in our lives with love and with peace, following our Savior to the end. Amen. Now, communion. As we come to this time in our service, we're reminded of where Jesus was going to. He set his face in Jerusalem, and one of the things we remember around this table is when Jesus was in Jerusalem, when he was in those final days before the resurrection. And we remember when he was with his disciples, with his friends that had been with him the whole time, and he knew that there was fear in the air. He knew the disciples were probably feeling all the big feelings of pain that they might know was ahead, of perhaps struggles that they might be thinking wrong-headed about, the way James and John were. And Jesus came to this table and he took what was around him, what they were eating, as a presence of love, and he took the bread that was there and he broke it. He took it and blessed it, and he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. He said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, we are here called to join in this meal, to join in this movement of love, even in the hardest times. Let us sing together. Let us pray. When we pray? Okay, let's pray. Lord, as we take of this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us strength for the journey before us. As we break the bread, we feel your love for us. We thank you with all our hearts for this great price you paid for us when you were crucified on the cross. Grant us grace and wisdom in the week ahead and show and in the week ahead that we may show your light to those that that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Dear God, we gather before you this morning to remember the sacrifice of your son. We cherish this cherish this moment every week where we come to your table in unison with other disciples of Christ churches. Help us to clear our minds and find peace as we drink from the cup. We gather around your table this morning, each of us with different concerns, fears, sorrows, joys, and hopes, but in unison we all seek your presence, comfort, and guidance. We acknowledge that we are not worthy of your grace, and we thank you for your unconditional love. We pray that you strengthen our faith, move us to action, and unify our hearts. Amen.
I'll ask those who sit in the last row to begin passing the offering plates uh, from the rear of the church, front of the church. You know, other than my financial pledge to St. Andrew, I give to several other organizations. That's probably true of most of us here. The trouble is, when we send money to Bread for the World or Southern Poverty Law or Salvation Army, what, whoever, it seems as though every other charity in the country learns about it. So we get all sorts of other requests in the mail. And sometimes we just can't help feeling guilty because can't do them all. I mean, of course I'd like to save the penguins. I love penguins, not that I've ever met one face to face, but they are adorable and I want to save them and the butterflies and the elephants and help with all the other things that are brought to my attention. Oh, there's guilt. And maybe I should add this organization uh, to my list that I just read about or heard about on the television. For those of you who have this guilt experience, I may have some help, maybe. I don't mean to insult anyone if you already know about tithing, but I was amazed when I learned how many of my congregation in Saginaw did not. They thought it was just another word for giving. A tithe is giving 10% of your income. It goes back to Old Testament times, and, sometime, and sometimes in some countries, it was used to determine the tax you were supposed to pay for the support of the church. I first learned about tithing in Sunday school when I was in upper elementary, I don't know, 10 o'clock, 10, 10 o'clock yet, 10 years old perhaps. My only problem then was how do I give 10% of my 25 cent Allowance, good leverage to convince mom and dad that to raise my allowance to 30 cents. <laughs> it works sometimes. <laughs> Seriously, I used the tithe as a guide for years and years, and I hope it is helpful for some of you. I have to be honest though. Just a few years ago, someone pointed out to me that according to Leviticus 27, verse 30, the tithe is what belongs to God, a gift goes above and beyond. <laughs> so, well, do the best you can and rejoice in the fact that you're doing some good. So I, ah, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I think I have a prayer list here too. Any more in here? In our prayers this morning, let us remember Scott Harmon, who's recovering from COVID. After a couple of days of feeling quite poorly, Scott has turned the corner and is starting to feel better. The Hall family, on the death of wife and mother, Jan, who passed away on June 18th after a short battle with pancreatic cancer. The Halls are neighbors of the Wickheisers and the Blankets. The Reverend Dr. Rich Hagapine, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, former pastor of Smoky Road Brethren Church, whose mother passed away in Illinois. Reverend Robin and Paul Orgoski. Robin is a pastor of Fellowship Lutheran, Lutheran Church. Paul's nephew died in a motorcycle accident this week. Arrangements have not been made yet. And all those with ongoing health issues who are, or who are recovering, let us pray. God, in all gratitude, we bring our gifts to you. 
We ask that you bless them that they do things according to your will. We pray for those names mentioned. And for other people who are not mentioned but who are in our hearts. We pray for our world. The terrible war situations that are going on. We pray for our country and all the invitedness. We thank God for bringing us some insight to use that. We ask all these prayers in the name of Christ. God of peace, God of love, we thank you for the opportunity to be with us today. And may we go from this place to places that need our love, and may we allow God's light to shine with God's presence of love and of grace on all those wrestling in the dark. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen.